CataractCoach.com. A run-out capsule rexus leads to vitreous. Now what do you do? This is a case performed by a resident. We've sped it up so we can get through it. Try pan blue dye. A little bit of a smaller pupil, not terrible. And starting with the capsule rexus. But look what happens. You let go in that danger zone, and here in the sub-incisional space, it's already run out. And you're not going to be able to continue to trying the little maneuver, and gosh, it just didn't work. It amputated. So now using a cystotome to nick the capsule, trying to continue. But now remember, we have already one area where the capsule has run out. So there's a weak spot there. And now continuing and switching over. Let's see now starting the rexus again. And what's going to happen next? Let's see. Waiting. This is why we speed the video up. And Van Ness scissors? Maybe not. Maybe just the forceps again. Okay. So there's that capsule rectus bringing that around. So we have the one area that's run out, which is in the sub-incisional space. That makes it tough because you can have that zipping around to the equator of the lens and then the posterior capsule, and you got a wide open posterior capsule. So let's help the resident by breaking this nucleus in the bag. You just chop it with a cannula and a chopper, and you've got two halves in the bag. That should make it a lot easier, and let's kind of mobilize these pieces and bring them up. So we're kind of... Uh, setting it up for the resident to have a more successful procedure here. So what's gonna happen? We're gonna take the phaco probe here, emulsify the pieces, and you've gotta be very careful about working in the capsular bag because that run out area, think about it, if it's in the sub-incisional space and you try to do a groove, let's say a stop and chop, and you make that groove down the middle, and when you separate or push the two halves apart, you can put enough stress on the, the run out area that it zips around to the back to the posterior capsule. And now you got a wide open posterior capsule. So here we go. Red's doing a great job here with a little bit of chop technique. I like that. Good job. Good work. Staying centrally there. And the overall video here is about an eight and a half, nine minute video. But remember, in real life, this case was 45 minutes, maybe even more, close to an hour. Things take time. And you'll see that especially when we get to the vitreous prolapse. So all the pieces are coming out nicely. At this point, I think you still have an intact anterior hyaloid face. But you can tell. Let's get these pieces out. And you can see the cap is already broken there. So there's that one big piece there. We don't want to leave that down there. So let's see if we can get that mobilized, injecting viscoelastic under it and bringing it up. And again, there's no vitreous in the anterior chamber at this point. I'm making extra paracentesis there. Let me see if I can help grab that piece, bring it up. We don't want it to fall into the vitreous cavity. And again, more viscoelastic. Viscoelastic is our friend. That's our dispersive viscoelastic. And that piece can be emulsified now. Being very careful to get the little last fragments. And don't come out of the eye just yet. You don't want to deflate the anterior chamber. Put viscoelastic first. And that's going to help keep that vitreous back. That looks pretty reasonable at this point. You haven't lost any nuclear pieces. There's just some cortex that needs to be removed. And how much vitreous is prolapsed? That's our big question. So you can't really stain the vitreous with the triamcinolone if it's all the if the eye is full of viscoelastic. So we're gonna take that out. So just lifting up the iris there with the chopper, and you can see there's still a lot of cortex that has to be removed. Do not leave this cortex behind. So putting in the bimanual approach now. Now there are three instruments in the eye because that chopper is me as I'm teaching this resident. So I can lift up the iris, help get access. And you're listening carefully. If you hear a ding, 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 that's the dinging of occlusion. And that means there is likely some vitreous that's blocking your port. But so far we've done okay with this bimanual approach. The viscoelastics was out. The cortex has been removed. It looks pretty clean now. Now it would be a great time to stain with the triamcinolone to see, is there vitreous present in that anterior chamber? So inject some triamcinolone and I swirl it around with the, the infusion there. And let's see. Yeah, there certainly is. And by coming out of the eye like that, look, you let it prolapse right out of the incision. So it shouldn't have come out of the eye like that. So you can grossly cut those very large strands while we set up the anterior vitrector. Going to do a bimanual 23 gauge anterior vitrectomy here. And you can see all that white is the stained um, vitreous with the triamcinolone. So making those pairs just slightly wider. Now there are three pairs in TC incisions. That'll give a lot of great access. Infusion in one. 
and then bringing those pieces down and the cutter in the other. Now, it's super important. You better know the difference between the two primary vitrectomy settings. One is called IA cut, meaning position one is irrigation, two is aspiration, three is the cutter. That's useful for removing cortex. And if you get vitreous, you can give it a few cuts and break that as well. Now, instead, what we're doing in this mode is anterior vitrectomy. Position one is irrigation, two is the vitrectomy cutter, and three is the aspiration. We don't want to put traction on that retina by, by pulling the vitreous. So we want to remove the vitreous, again, restaining it. It looks pretty good. Let's do complete clean out here. And so that a little bit of a white reflex is because you have triamcinolone particles in the vitreous. That will help. Do not worry. So checking again. And I think we pretty much cleared all of the vitreous from the anterior segment. Now we can safely implant a sulcus eye well. Now you can see, look at the rip in the central cap. So you can see exactly what happened there. So making a quick little peripheral iridotomy, not 100% required, but sometimes can be useful in these cases. With the anterior chamber lens, you certainly need the peripheral iridotomy. With a sulcal lens, you really don't. But if you already have the 23 gauge vitrector, it's very easy to do. We have a separate video on that. If you don't know how to use the vitrector to make a small peripheral iridotomy, cataractcoach.com and use the search function. So now lens insertion. Uh, let's see, three-piece lens, put the whole lens on the iris first. I like this idea. And make sure it's the correct orientation, the anti-S, that looks great. And let's just dial this in gently into the sulcus. One haptic at a time, just rotate it in. And we want to get both haptics nicely squared away in the sulcus. And you want it about this position. You want it to be in the area of the greatest capsular support. So take your time here. There's really no rush. And then make sure there's proper support of those haptics. And that looks pretty good. So there's one haptic in for sure. The second haptic is going to be rotated around. And again, finding a good area of support. And if you need to fine tune that adjustment and positioning of the haptics, please do so. That looks great. Let me show you the end here. Now, don't leave the eye without a suture. Definitely place a suture in that main incision. If there is flattening of the anterior chamber of the post eye period, you can have vitreous prolapse. Right now, there's no vitreous in the anterior segment. Let's keep it that way. So do that, and we'll seal up the other incisions. And then now we can do a bimanual IA with the vitrector. Just put it on cortex or, or viscoelastic removal mode and go in through the two side ports. Remember, this patient does have a higher risk of retinal detachment, retinal break. You better check the retina in the post eye period. Higher risk of CME, cystoid macular edema. Higher risk of endophthalmitis. Let's put some intracameral moxifloxacin as well. So watch this patient carefully in the post op period, and I'm happy to report that this patient had a good outcome and no negative sequelae in the post op period. Next time you know what happens, if you get a run-out capsulorexis, it can lead to vitreous loss. Thanks for watching these videos, and remember to go to cataractcoach.com and sign up for a free daily email. We'll send you an email every day with a great video like this and other surgical pearls that'll make you a better surgeon.